A few introductory comments. Pollution kills us. And as we've just heard, carbon dioxide is plant food, which has a very slight effect on the atmospheric temperature. And we are always adding carbon dioxide to the, uh, to the atmosphere. Humans are just one of those forces that add carbon dioxide. And what do I see as a geologist? Well, I see the planet always changes. It always has. Climate change is quite normal. And the amount and the speed of climate change at present is nothing unusual. For most of time, the planet has been warm and wet. For a very short period of time on planet Earth, we have had ice. We are actually living in unusual times. And just as a brief preamble, as a scientist, my conclusions are married to evidence. If that evidence changes, I change my conclusions. And my evidence has nothing to do with religion or politics or whether you live in the Northern Hemisphere and I live in the Southern Hemisphere. But it is important to note that science is funded by governments who in some cases want a certain result. As a geologist, we see the planet changes. There are cycles. And these cycles are well established. What I'm interested in is the first change, the random changes. And I want to argue at this conference that one volcano can ruin your whole day. It can also ruin your climate theory. So we've heard about solar activity. We've heard from Professor Weisser on carbon dioxide and plants, something I want to come back to. And we certainly heard in the last talk that things were much warmer in the medieval warming. So the way we can understand the future or the present is to look back in time. And when, when we look back in time, change is normal. Professor Weisser mentioned that in geological time, we are at a period when carbon dioxide is very low. In black is the atmospheric carbon dioxide. In blue is temperature. That only shows the last 500 million years. We have had six major ice ages within which we have interglacials and glaciations. Every one of those six major ice ages started when carbon dioxide was higher than now. So there is no correlation. It is clear that there are other factors involved. We also see that carbon dioxide, as we heard in the last talk, is tied up in life. This rock here is limestone. That rock contains 44% carbon dioxide. This rock forms from life. So we've been naturally sequestering carbon dioxide. And the next great scare that is go going to send us to the bank and giving out money and paying indulgences is going to be ocean acidification. The oceans recycle carbon dioxide. Seawater buffers pH. And the circulation of ocean water through sediments and through rocks buffers the ocean. We have had alkaline oceans since the first Thursday that this planet had oceans. And we have had alkaline oceans at times when the carbon dioxide content has been a thousand times higher than now. So if we look in the past, forget ocean acidification. We heard before the temperature rises are then followed by a carbon dioxide rise. We can see in modern times that the temperature rises have all been at the same rate, despite what carbon dioxide is doing, and hence there's no correlation in modern times between carbon dioxide and temperature. And 
we can see that some volcanoes can tell us an enormous amount. This is Krakatoa. I climbed it on my 60th birthday. But the interesting thing about the carbon dioxide measuring station on Krakatoa is it's not where the carbon dioxide comes out. It comes out at the top of Krakatoa and in fractures. And the measuring station is at a safe place away from eruptions. So even our volcanic measuring of carbon dioxide might not be correct. And we look at modern times and we see that carbon dioxide is going down, uh, sorry, is going up and temperatures going down. Without correlation, there is no causation. So let's start looking at some of my favourite volcanoes. Some of these have rele released very large amounts of aerosols, as sulphur dioxide and also released carbon dioxide. It is very hard to calculate these figures. The point of this slide is to show that we have had some very, very large historical eruptions. These have been on the land. And when we have these eruptions, they can change the weather and they release gases. The most abundant gas from a volcano is water vapour. The second most abundant is carbon dioxide. We have had volcanoes on planet Earth for 4,567 million years. That carbon dioxide has to go somewhere. The water's gone into the water cycle. The carbon dioxide has gone into rocks. And we can look at where some of these volcanoes are. Last week I was in Indonesia at Marapi volcano. It's erupting. And there are huge amounts of sulphur gases coming out of these terrestrial volcanoes. But these are not the important volcanoes. These are the volcanoes we see. Volcanoes like Krakatoa, they tell a wonderful story. And we all get frightened about Krakatoa type eruptions. They put out aerosols, they put out gases, but they are not the big volcanoes. And we can see that Krakatoa on the left diagram has had many lava flows in recent times. Top right is a Strombolian eruption and the bottom right I'm desperately trying to climb to the top of Krakatoa. And these volcanoes are pumping out gases out of fractures, out of vents, before an eruption, during an eruption and after an eruption. So volcanoes can change the atmosphere. A place I have worked on a lot is Milos in Greece. Large volcanic crater, gas vents, where we've had explosion of gases. These are gas vent holes, very common in volcanoes to see gas vents. Teaching my students, I'm sitting in a hot spring, all of these rocks here have been changed by gas from a volcano. These rocks were carbonate rocks. These were hot spring precipitates a long time ago. And in any modern geothermal area, we have precipitates of carbonates. We have tied up carbon dioxide, Pamukkale. These are other areas in Turkey. So every time we get terrestrial volcanic activity, we get carbonate minerals. This is underground in the Philippines. We see veins of carbonate. These contain 44% carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide comes from deep in the earth. These are the volcanoes we see, like here in Chile, a big fracture where we've had volcanoes and degassing, carbonate rocks deposited from that degassing. And even in Antarctica, we have a large volcanic belt underneath the ice. And we have had very big eruptions in Antarctica in Roman times. These volcanics are destabilizing the ice. They are adding heat. They are adding gases. And one of the biggest emitters of chlorine and fluorine gases is Mount Erebus. It emits hydrochloric acid and hydrofluoric acid. These destroy ozone. So we don't measure many volcanoes and we see a schematic model of a volcano. There is a type of volcano that is a gas volcano. It doesn't have lava. They just burp gas and give us craters. 
Many of these gas volcanoes are the volcanoes where we find diamond. Many of them exist as crater lakes where we've had gas explosions. And any rock that was once molten has emitted gas. To melt a rock, you need heat and pressure, and then you need a flux to lower the melting temperature. And the fluxes are water vapour and carbon dioxide. And as that melt rises, it boils off gas. So when we look at cubic kilometres of rock that was molten, all we can say is a huge amount of gas came out into the atmosphere. And we see that. This is the crater of Tobar in Indonesia or Yellowstone in North America. These were big eruptions which released gas. Before the eruption, as the melt rose up, we released gas. During the eruption, it was driven by gas. After the eruption, there was gas. These are volcanoes we see. But this is the rock type that you can dissolve a large amount of carbon dioxide in. It is a rock type of basalt. You find it in the Rheingraben. You find it at Kassel. It is a rock where you can dissolve a very large amount of sulphur gases and of carbon dioxide. And some of these eruptions produce huge amounts of lava in short periods of time, such as in the Talnak Basin in Siberia, such as in the Deccan Traps in India. So I want to now focus on basalts. And we see basalts in the Red Sea. There was an eruption here a couple of years ago where we're pulling apart the Red Sea and the decrease in pressure deep down in the earth partially melts rocks and they rise because they have dissolved gas. So we see in the Nubian area and the Arabian Shield, we see volcanic rocks where there are cavities, where gas has been moving through the cavity. And here we see a rock that's 2,000 million years old, also a basalt, and cavities are filled with calcium carbonate. So it is the basalts that are most interesting. And every time we pull apart continents, and this is a continent of Rodinia that was pulled apart some 800 million years ago. Every time we pull apart continents, we release gas and we release basalt, like this basalt here that came up associated with the pulling apart of the continent. And this basalt um, released a very large amount of carbon dioxide. There are some bizarre volcanoes. This volcano is a carbonatite. It is a molten rock that is carbonate. It contains calcium and magnesium and sodium carbonate. It contains more than 40% carbon dioxide. They are multiple intrusions which are ringed. You can find them from the air with magnetism. There is a type of volcano that is only a carbon dioxide volcano. These are not at all rare. We find underneath the sea, bubbling carbon dioxide. Here in shallow water in Papua New Guinea. In deeper water, we find liquid carbon dioxide on the ocean floor. These are volcanoes that are releasing a very common greenhouse gas. So we can argue that the very, very early carbon dioxide on planet Earth came from volcanoes. We would have had hot springs. We would have had black smokers, and here these are some very ancient sulphide rocks, and the white mineral is calcium carbonate. So we have very good evidence that the degassing of the planet very, very early on released a lot of carbon dioxide. But we don't need a volcano to release carbon dioxide. We have many, many earthquakes every year, at least 10,000 major earthquakes. Every time we have an earthquake, we release carbon dioxide and we release warm water. This is very common. Every time that we push mountains together, every time that we decide to bend rocks and form mountains, 
we boil off carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide is here where we've had rocks which we've bent. We have really put these rocks under pressure. Same here. And what have we released? Carbon dioxide, which forms as calcium carbonate minerals. So every time we bend rocks, we release carbon dioxide. When we cook up rocks, we change dirty limestones into calcium silicate rocks and we boil off carbon dioxide. Every time we have a supervolcano underneath the ocean, we boil off carbon dioxide. We don't see them from carbon dioxide because it dissolves in seawater. What we see is a chemical fingerprint from helium and we dissolve carbon dioxide from these massive submarine eruptions into the cold, high-pressure seawater. And what is quite extraordinary is just before an El Nino event, we have a swarm of earthquakes. That is telling us that molten rock is rising. That swarm of earthquakes is in the East Pacific. It is quite intriguing that earthquakes Swarms and eruptions precede an El Nino, and these are submarine eruptions. And so we have areas of the Earth where we're pulling it apart, areas where we're pushing it together, such as here, and areas where we have volcanoes along these fractures. So how many volcanoes do we have? We can measure them. We have about a 1,000 active volcanoes above the sea level. We have millions below sea level. The ones above sea level emit carbon dioxide, but not very much. And the ones below sea level, the basalts, emit a huge amount of carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide comes out of lava and hot springs and gas vents. Every year, we pull apart the oceans. We have 64,000 kilometres of mid-ocean ridges. We cool that by circulating water through this new basalt. There is a recent projection of the number of volcanoes that we have in the sea floor. Along those 64,000 kilometres, we don't know how many volcanoes, but there are probably hundreds of thousands. Off that mid-ocean ridge, we have seamounts. These are submarine volcanoes, well described by Charles Darwin in 1842. And we think we have about three and a half million of these volcanoes. What makes it interesting is we have not one measuring station for these volcanoes. Not one measuring station. We have about 20 very good measuring stations above the land. Not one below sea level. And we had a surprise. In 1999, an area of the ocean floor, which is pulling apart very slowly, had a massive deep water submarine eruption. The only way you can have an eruption when there's three kilometres of water on top of you is to have a very high gas pressure. And the calculations show that that eruption had lava with about 13.5% carbon dioxide dissolved in it. That may well have been the reason for recent warming of the Arctic. We have no me uh, measurement at all. And when we dissolve this basalt volcano carbon dioxide into seawater, we don't see it for thousands of years until it upwells to the surface. So we're making predictions with the atmosphere when we don't know very much about the carbon budget. It is hard to measure it. We can only speculate, but what we do know is that beneath us, in the mantle of the Earth, which occupies the greatest volume of the Earth, we have a very large amount of carbon dioxide. We have carbon compounds, the most delightful one, of course, is diamond. But we have a very high solubility of carbon dioxide in the mantle. And when we partially melt the mantle to produce a basalt lava, to make that mantle melt, we need a flux. 
and that is carbon dioxide. <laughs> and so we try to measure carbon dioxide, and a very large number of the measuring stations are on volcanoes that are releasing carbon dioxide. So I argue that our measurement of carbon dioxide above the, the sea level is not very good, and we don't measure anything on the sea floor. So we know very little about volcanoes beneath the sea floor. There is a huge uncertainty that we have with these volcanoes in Laki in Iceland. About 500 metres from the Laki volcano is a, another small volcano with a gas vent. And the carbon dioxide coming out of that is very much different from Lucky. So just on the scale of one or two kilometres, there is massive uncertainty. And if the IPCC, God bless them, were correct, then all of that carbon dioxide coming out from the volcanoes should have accumulated in the atmosphere because they argue, unlike the previous speaker, that there is a very long residence time for carbon dioxide. Well, the atmospheric carbon dioxide content is low. And it is low because we're recycling that volcanic carbon dioxide into seawater and into life. And then it gets involved in the water and carbon cycles that we've just heard about. Those people who disagree with me quote one source and one source only, and this paper by Gerlach, who is arguing that there's almost no carbon dioxide that comes out from volcanoes. And he has quoted seven observatories and has totally ignored what happens beneath the oceans. But what is even more interesting is the isotope signature of carbon dioxide coming from basalts is the same as the isotope signature of carbon from burning fossil fuels. So again, if you want to calculate, and it's not a good way of calculating carbon dioxide from fossil fuels, if you want to calculate that, you cannot ignore another source of carbon which has the same isotopic signature. So uh, to conclude, there are millions of volcanoes emitting carbon dioxide. Not one of them is measured. We do not see any of them. And the minimum calculations that we do show us that there is a huge amount of carbon dioxide that comes out of those submarine volcanoes and is a major but unseen and unrecognised contributor to carbon dioxide.